Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Acts video. Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge found here on the internet. All right, today's video is a little bit different in that I'm going to be reacting to a video that I had a small part in. Now, I've uh, promoted this channel before recently, and if you don't know, this is the best history channel that you may not be watching right now, and it is Drawn of History. So Drawn of History is an animated um, series by another history teacher, Mr. Betts, and he makes this amazing content. I like to call it basically oversimplified for American history. And it's a new channel and it really could use your support and I promise you that you'll like it. Well, anyway, um, he has recently finished up uh, putting out his series, it's a three-part series on the War of 1812, the war that only Canadians care about. Anyway, um, he asked if I would be interested in doing some lines uh, for one of the characters, and I thought, heck yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. So um, I have some lines in these different parts of these uh, videos, and we're going to go ahead and watch them all. I haven't fully watched all of the videos yet, and there's three parts, each ranging about 10 to 12 minutes each, and I just want to do it all. So we got a long video video for you here um, to be able to learn about the War of 1812 and we'll see because I have not heard myself back yet and I'm sure it's going to be super cringe to, to hear me but it was a lot of fun and I definitely like to do it more. So anyway go ahead and get yourself I don't know a drink and settle in and we'll have some fun uh, watching all three of these videos. All right, the original video uh, links are down below. Make sure that you please, please, please support Drawn of History. Um, it's amazing. Uh, I really, really think you'll like it. Even if you're not an American, if you're interested at all in American history, it does have some non-American history stuff too, but a lot of American history stuff, I promise you'll like it. So definitely click the links down below, sub, give it a view, all that stuff. And let's get this channel to be uh, much more popular than it is right now because it really deserves it. All right, let's do this. All right, so this is episode one, and I love I love how he uh, titles this. It's War of 1812, Starting America's Dumbest War. Uh, so this is great. I don't think I have many lines in the first um, episode from what I think he told me. I think there's more in episodes two and three. But uh, I think I may, maybe I have one in this. I forgot, but let's, let's see. And I'll obviously let you know when it's my part, but let's just learn about the War of 1812 here. Oh, I love, it's like... Vice Thirteen. Stop drawing. Th that intro. I, I got to do that again because this is this is like my child. This is like Saved by the Bell. You're in the high school, North America Colonial High School. Awesome. Now, <laughs> now we got the colonies. Thirteen. Stop drawing on your desk. Thirteen. Stop colonies. drawing on my desk. Stop smuggling tea. Stop not paying taxes. Why are you always hassling me so much? Because you're ungrateful. Now. Hey, Canada. I'm going to ditch class next period. You want to come? By the way, the writing is so good. Sorry, I, we're going to be here for like four hours if I stop too much. I'm sorry. With you? Uh, no. Well, I forgot. You're all goody-goody colony. Why are you always acting better than me? Um, I True. don't know. Maybe because your homespun clothes look like snotty handkerchiefs? Come on, you and me. We should totally hook up. Yeah. Okay, I, I know you want historical context. Homespun clothes. So part of the American protest against the British was the fact that the British had basically forced the Americans to buy British goods. And as part of the protest or boycotts was boycotting the British uh, clothing and then do more of an attempt at trying to make your own and, and home homespinning it. And yeah, there he's, he's ragging on Canada because Canada didn't do a, um, a revolution. They basically got their independence kind of naturally without a straight up war like the Americans again. So that's what they're referring to there. Again, we're going to be here for oh, way too long like if I comp in too much. We could be kissing cousins. Ugh, the Liberty Bell. <laughs> so freaking weird. One day, Canada. Is that Mexico walking away? One day. So good. It's 1776, and the 13 colonies were tired of being simps for England. They were <laughs> sick and tired Topical of paying taxes humor. for nothing. 
Other than war debt from the French and Indian War, which they kind of started. They were sick and tired of British troops trying to take the guns they had been stockpiling to shoot British troops. <laughs> and they were sick and tired of drinking cheap, crappy British East India tea. They wanted to drink smuggled and slightly more expensive crappy tea. Right. So they declared independence and it sucked. Turns out fighting your superpower colonial daddy is hard, so for help, they turn to France, England's arch nemesis, the stiff wind to England's Trump hair. <laughs> Louis the 16th, we somehow won the Battle of Saratoga, signaling that we might actually win this war. With your help, that is. If France becomes our ally, you could defeat your enemy England, force them to lose their most valuable colonies, and possibly regain some of your own. Stop! A man can only get so hard. So America won the war and its independence. Americans have compl I mean, not completely, but totally glossed over how important Ben Franklin was and the fact that he got France and that it got France involved. Right. And he, he was basically the spokesman for the Americans. I mean, he had to go to he had to go to Parliament. To, to explain why the Americans are being so whiny. And also, he's basically the American bas ambassador. And he went, you know, of course, to uh, um, to France. And then that's something that's completely glossed over is how important France was to the colonies in the um, um, in the in the, in the American Revolution. I mean, it, it just, it would not have turned out the same way without the French. With France's help. And by help, it was more like France beat the boss while little brother United States mashed away on a controller that True. wasn't even plugged in. True! True! Oh, I, I don't know if kids relate to this, okay? I was guilty of getting this done, I think, to me, because I was a youngest child, but also doing it, I think, later on to, to younger people. You have the NES, greatest console. By the way, some of you have, have commented you, you missed my NES collection. That was in my old house, and I need a new game room with all my NES collection. Anyway, you're, you're in the game, and you have some little brother, friend, I don't know, something, that wants to play with you, and they suck. And they're going to ruin the game. So you're like, all right, you're, you're, you're the one playing. And you give them a controller. Here, Oswald, sorry. little brother, United States. Okay, give them the controller. Mashed away on a controller that wasn't even. And you don't plug it in. Now, some of the smarter kids that get grifted in this, and I think I was one, and I know the kids that I, I had to do this to as well, they picked up on this, that they weren't actually playing, and then they get pissed, but so true. Plugged in. The Treaty of Paris, signed in 1783, ended the conflict and established the new order in North America. Ah, with this treaty, the matter has been settled. I'm not so sure these terms will be fulfilled. We've gained the Northwest Territory, but England isn't abandoning their forts there. We've secured fishing rights off the coast of Canada, but we're already getting hassled by British naval ships. And as for us returning Loyalist property... That's not happening. I mean, you could have it back if you want. Oh, that was one of the deals of the, um, <clears throat> of the, of the Treaty of Paris was that all that damaged property and, uh, and all the debts that were basically to the British, but also the loyalists. The, the The British wanted to make sure the loyalists there didn't get screwed over after. A lot led to Canada and stuff like that, but that they would actually get it back. And I hadn't really, I didn't really know how if that process really happened very much. And, but apparently it did. I mean, I'm sorry, it didn't. And, and I didn't think it would. That yeah, there was still gonna. It wasn't gonna be that friendly of a of a return back to normalcy for these people. Yeah, but you forgot the most important part. Great Britain has recognized us as a free and independent nation, something that they will never forget or ever try to question. Hey guys, look at the shadows this candle's giving me. One, <laughs> two, three, four shadows. It's foreshadowing. Meanwhile. Oh. So we won the Americans' war against England, but we didn't get any land. Nah. We didn't get back Canada, get Louisiana, the get Caribbean nothing. colonies, or our holdings in India. That's the other thing, like people understand. France got absolutely nothing from helping the Americans. Okay, they had lost the Seven Years' War to the British back in the fifties. Now are fighting here, fought here in the seventies and then into the seventeen eighties, and got nothing out of it other than sticking it to an old enemy. At incredible cost, that of course was levied onto the people, and you get the French Revolution, of course, right after. But France got nothing out of helping. No. 
And the war costs a billion livres, so the country is going bankrupt? Yep. Well, at least it can't get any worse. Revolution. Hello, do you have a second to talk about our Lord and Savior? Revolution! <laughs> <laughs> Back across the Atlantic, yes. the young American republic yes. started to make its way in the world. You know, declaring neutrality, establishing trade, displacing native people, American type stuff. Then an old friend came knocking on the door. Hey America! Oh, Gosh. hey France! Hey, remember how you had a revolution because you wanted to have liberty and hate the taxes and stupid kings? Well, yes, yes I do! Oh, we did the same thing, man! That's fantastic! What are you doing now that you have a revolution? We're cutting off everyone's f***ing head! It's bonkers, man! You would love it! Do you want in? No, I, I think we're okay. So Joseph <laughs> Hall, I got to head back. England and the rest of Europe is pooping bricks right now, and I gotta put this mean short son of a bitch in charge. Napoleon. I really want to buy New Orleans. If it's for sale, I will sell it to you. Hey, I thought Spain owned it. You fell off a truck, it's mine now. I will sell you New Orleans and all of Louisiana for say fifty million dollars. Really? Are you sure? Yes, well, I am about to go to war with all of Europe, and I do not have the time to invade you from there right now. Wait, what? Nothing. We have a deal? We oui. bon. Au revoir. Now having both... Yeah, originally, the United States was just going to make an, a, a, a pretty, a really substantial offer for New Orleans. Um, and when, when, then when approached with it, um, Napoleon's like, you know what? I'll give you all of our stuff there in North America. Like, don't even care. He needed quick money for his war in Europe. And it, you know, took a little bit more money. It took uh, a few more million dollars than, than um, the Americans had had agreed to. Well, the, the, the Congress and everybody had had a kind of agreed to for just New Orleans. But the deal was so good they couldn't pass it up. I mean, double the size of the United States. So from the American perspective, I guess, thank you, Napoleon. The Northwest Territory and the Louisiana Territory, and since baseball had not been invented yet, America Griffey, engaged rookie in its card. original favorite pastime, King Griffey, taking Jr. Indian land. White settlers had steadily been heading west, encroaching on Native American land yeah. and plopping down pretty much wherever they pleased. Some tribes were bought off, but others had the gall to stand there and fight. <laughs> Two such brazen Shawnee Native Americans living them in the Indiana themselves. Territory were Tecumseh and his brother Tenskatawa, aka the Prophet. Brothers and sisters, the problems that affect one of us affect us all. We need to unite to form a confederation that can defend all of us from the Americans. Yes, and I've been to the other side. I've spoken with the Master of Life. He has shown me two worlds, one of blessings and one of pain. And we must reject the white ways of the evil spirit, their customs, their goods, their alcohol, and the way that they put up inspirational words on their living room walls. I mean, <laughs> what is that? It's really I hate these. Anyone else hate these? I'm glad they're kind of going out. Family is love, beautiful trust, traditions, blessings, smiles forever, joy, strength, patient laughter. What about live, laugh, love? Oh, oh cringe. The governor of the Indiana Territory, William Henry Harrison, was not impressed and fearful of their growing power. Hey, if you're so buddy-buddy with your master of life, why don't you make the sun disappear? And then there was an eclipse. Oh, fart. Psst, come, sir. Come here. What is it, white man? If you're going to unite the people along the Mississippi, you're probably going to need these. Why are you giving me these? Why should I trust you British, who abandoned us after the revolution? Well, if you haven't noticed, I still have territory in Canada. And my hands are full with this Napoleon guy. But if you don't want these guns, I'm sure I can find a home for them. Leave them and go. Brother. I must venture off and unite the people. I leave you in charge, but please don't start anything with the Americans, okay? We're just, just not yet, okay? Why? If they shoot us, the master of life will ensure the bullets simply bounce off. Yeah, that's not how bullets work. Just yeah, exactly. Just chill and I'll be works. back. That's Unbeknownst to the brothers, Harrison had received permission to lead a raid of soldiers and militiamen on Prophetstown, the central headquarters of Tecumseh's Confederacy. I was wondering what kind of profit it was. Like, make money, P-R-O-F, or... Men on Prophetstown, profit, like the central headquarters of Tecumseh's Confederacy. <laughs> they won't even see us coming. And then the Prophet quickly disregarded his brother's instructions. 
What would be known as the Battle of Tippecanoe wasn't particularly a victory for either side. Unless you ask Harrison. Oh, that was great. Deadly, I mean, it was great. We sure taught them savages a lesson or two. Didn't you lose just as many men as they did? Well, yes, but... Did you kill the prophet? No, he got away. Well, did you get Tecumseh? No, he wasn't even there. But we did push them back, and then I burned Prophet's town to the ground. Wow, so we're burning down our enemies' capitals now. Hope that doesn't become a thing. Hey, look at all these shadows! The <laughs> Battle of Tippecanoe further strengthened the alliance between the Brits and the Native Americans and fueled American anger at both. Also, back in 1803, <laughs> the Napoleonic Wars started in Europe. What is this France from? Pretty much taking on everyone. Because England and France were too busy killing each other, the United States started getting filthy rich trading with both countries. This is because I'm playing both sides. That, so that that's amazing, because that's what America... Once America became independent... America always did like tried to, uh, tried to trade with countries that are at war. It's also brought the United States into conflicts, both with uh, World War One and World War Two later on. That United States doing business with countries at war is always a big threat for the United States because um, you're putting your 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 own risk if you're going into war zones, but also the political aspect of it of. Um, like if you're doing more business with one side, then you know the, the the other side can really look at you as like like an enemy, even if you declare neutrality. Um, but you know, doing business with one side, especially if it's war materials, uh, can bring something in. But yeah, United States always finds a way. There's a war going on. They they're gonna make a, find a way to to make some money off of it. Always come out on top. As you can expect, soon both France and England started ignoring supposed American neutrality and seized ships bound for their respective yeah. rivals. Yeah, because. Are you neutral if you're doing business with a country at war? That's always been the big thing. From the American perspective, it's always been yes. From this War of 1812 to World War I to World War II. But from the other perspective, it's no. You're doing business with somebody at war. You are fair game. Make matters worse, England started impressing sailors on these American ships. And that's the story of how I ordered coffee behind Emma Watson. Oh. <laughs> no, not that impressment. Oh, and now you're part of the British Navy. Oh. Yeah, that one. England needed all of their sailors and then some. But many British sailors had deserted the British Navy, claimed they had become American citizens, or just left for better pay on neutral American ships. So English naval officers would stop US vessels and try to determine which sailors were really British. A's British. A's British. Yeah, Among Us guy. Don't I know you? No, sir. I'm from New Jersey. Oh, Lord, he must be telling the truth. No one would ever lie and say <laughs> they were from New Jersey. Over 6,000 men, most of them actually British, were impressed. I think I think Mr. Betts works in uh, New York City. It was always that great rivalry, New Yorkers and New Jersey people. And most true Americans were eventually released. But what incensed Americans the most were the orders in council. By this point, Napoleon had taken over all of the European continent and passed the Berlin Decree, banning all ships under his continental system or even neutral ships from using British ports. Not to be outdone, the British countered with the orders in council, saying all continental ports are hereby blockaded. And neutral ships headed to them needed to first stop in Britain, submit to a search, pay a duty, trade the cookies their mommies had packed them, but <laughs> perhaps worst of all... First you gotta do the truffle shuffle. Come on! <laughs> do it! Come on! Goonies! Do it! <laughs> then President Thomas Jefferson had had enough and persuaded Congress to pass the Embargo Act of 1807, meaning that American merchants couldn't import or export goods. That'll show them. As you can guess, the American economy... Interesting how... I mean, we're in 1807. I mean, the the war's still uh, uh, years away. Um, but how long the lead-up of this was. I mean, it's, it's like it's been building since American independence. At least it's been building since the end of the French Revolution. Or, or specifically, I should say, the rise of Napoleon, right? Right in the early 1800s. A good 10 years before the actual War of 1812. Promptly fell into the toilet. Congratulations, you plagued yourself. In 1809, the Embargo Act was switched out with the Non-Intercourse Act, which really only made trade with England and France forbidden and didn't really make the situation much better. So between the aiding of Indians, the impressment of men, and the orders in council, Stonks. America kinda wanted to go to war with England? Jefferson's successor, President James Madison, tri no, no, go down, go down, roll down. He there was short. Go. Madison had tried to work it out. Hey, he was short. how about this? I'll trade with whoever agrees to stop attacking our ships, okay? Fine, I'll stop attacking your ships. Be neutral, whatever. What about you, England? You in? No. 
This is stupid. Well, if he's not going to stop, I'm not going to either. Nationalism oh, swelled in the United States with a second war for independence being called for by young war hawks like Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun. Just curious, what did these dashingly handsome men look like a few decades later? Uh, oh my God! What's wrong with your uh, face? Madison was pushed to ask Congress for. To be fair, everyone looked really terrible in um, 19th century photography. Declaration of War on June 1st, 1812. Debate raged along party lines with Democratic Republicans calling for war and Federalists calling against. We need to restore the honor of this great nation! Yeah, well, we need to restore our economy, you dolt. The only thing preventing us from expanding are the Indians, who are supplied by the Brits! Great! We gotta have our ports blown up so you can have some more cow patties! Hell, if we do this thing right, we could grab Canada! They'd be happy to join us! We could grab Canada. We could grab Canada. We could grab Canada. Braces. Canada? <laughs> I'm coming, baby. Let's go to war. So by the smallest margin of votes to do so, the nation would ever cast, so the United good. States declared war so on good. England. But wait. Coincidentally, just days <laughs> after the war had Flanders. been declared, England repealed the orders in council. Maybe this war wouldn't be needed after all. Word was rushed across the Atlantic, and when it reached the shore, it was greeted by... <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> yes. Hey, Mr. Beat, what brings you here? Our collab. Remember, you are doing the War of 1812, which takes place both in the U.S. and Canada, Beat? and I did a video comparing the United States and Canada. Oh, yeah. And looky, looky, you... Another awesome uh, um, big history um, teacher, Mr. Beat, who does uh, stuff, I think, in the original video. It's got some links to his stuff. He's a, he's a teacher that makes a lot of content as well. You can check out that video over here. Check out another Drone of History video over there. Subscribe or even become one of these Patreon superheroes. So, uh, Mr. Beat, you did a video about Canada? Sure did. Did she happen to mention me? No, she didn't. Damn it. Okay. Good stuff. So I didn't have any okay, so I didn't have any lines in that one. Um and I, I think I think he actually may have told me that, that maybe it was in second or third, but that was amazing. That was so good. I learned a ton of of, of the lead ups, the lead up to the war, um, which was so, so cool. So um but yeah, let's go ahead and jump in. So that was episode one. You'll see the link down below. Again, go go to that. Like, subscribe, thumb up, all that stuff. Um, and then let's go ahead and uh, we'll jump right into episode two. Previously on Drawn of History. One day, Canada. It's 1776 and the 13 colonies were tired of being simps for England. Great Britain has recognized us as a free and independent nation, something that they will never forget or ever try to question. So between the aiding of Indians, the impressment of men, and the orders in council, America kinda wanted to go to war with England? We could grab Canada. I'm coming, baby. Let's go to war. England repealed the orders in council. Maybe this war wouldn't be needed after all. <laughs> Fuck you. Let's do this. <laughs> all right, war time. Episode two. Mm. Hey, so this one's actually called Fighting America's Dumbest War. Okay. Ollie, we just declared war on Britain. Wow, that's exciting. Wait a minute. You and what army? The U.S. Army. We have an army? No, they really didn't. At the start of the war, the United States had an army of about yeah. 7,000 men. Yeah. That's it. See, early America didn't really like the idea of a standing peacetime army. It sounded very kingish to them. If things did pop off, that's what militias were for. To defend and keep the peace if need be. It's right there in the Second mm. Amendment. I feel like people might focus on the second sure. part too much. Maybe I should underline the first part. Nah, it's crystal clear and can in no way be misinterpreted. America's Navy wasn't in much better shape either. Whereas Daddy of the Ocean Britain had 100 ships of the line and 200 frigates, the United States had, uh, let me see, yeah, zero ships of the line and seven frigates. They also had yeah. a handful of brigs, a few schooners, and a couple of canoodles. Lucky so yeah, you're not going to win a naval battle, right, against the British. I mean, that's anybody, basically, 
world history. Uh, but that's a major problem for the United States, not having a standing army if somebody wanted to exploit that. And was still being the little pain in Europe's big butt, so the Americans wouldn't have to face the full might of the British military. Right. Yet. Still, organizing any American war effort American was going to be difficult. Communication was slow. Dial-up internet slow. You've got mail. At the isolated yet strategically valuable American Fort Mackinac, commanding officer Lieutenant Porter Hanks only found out about the war when... Americans, do you give up? Oh, what? Oh, fart. British forces in the war <laughs> might have been fewer, but they were good. Aided by Canadian militias, the British regulars were well trained and their officers battle tested. Of note was Major General Isaac Brock, who was like every positive trait of Disney princes, Frankenstein into one person. He was so <laughs> likable that men wanted to be him, women wanted to be with him, grandmas wanted to feed him, manja, manja. an artist wanted to draw him. <laughs> and he needed to be because he had the task of getting Tecumseh and his confederacy to ally with the British once again. Why should we? So you can abandon us again like you did after the war for independence? Why should I trust you? Because like you, I've been a warrior my entire life and give you my word as such. Let's play a game, all right? On the count of three, name your biggest threat here in North America. Don't even think about it. One, two, three. United, United States. States. Hey. Relative killed by the Americans during the revolution. Older brother. If you were a chick, who's the one guy you would sleep with? John, John Stamos. 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 What? Did we just become best friends? Yup. You want to go kick some American butt? Yup. <laughs> the strategy of the British was basically to defend Canada. Good strategy considering the Americans planned a three-point invasion of their northern neighbor. But first, an American officer was sent to test out the theory that Canadians would welcome the Americans as liberators with open arms. My Canadian brothers, we, the United States, are here to free you from the tyranny of Great Britain. <laughs> Yeah, I guess we're gonna have to go with that invasion plan. First, they would invade Canada from Detroit in August. Outside Fort Detroit, Brock, having few British soldiers, knew he was outnumbered. To fix this, Brock dressed the militia up like lobsterbacks to make them seem more intimidating. He also learned that the American general William Hull was deathly afraid of Indians. So he had to come to march his men in really? front of the fort three times to make them look more numerous. It had the desired effect. Hull surrendered the fort and his <laughs> men shortly after. In November, 6,000 American soldiers and militiamen were tasked with taking Montreal. They were led by Major General Henry Dearborn, former Revolutionary War hero and current Mrs. Doubtfire doppelganger. <laughs> <laughs> the invasion failed when half the troops refused to invade and the half that did ended up in a fierce battle with each other. The most noteworthy of the three-point invasion happened one month earlier when the Americans, led by General Stephen von Rensselaer, tried to cross the Niagara River into Upper Canada. The Americans were briefly able to take Queenstown Heights before being pinned down by First Nation warriors Yeet. and British reinforcements. As well as this being the first real contest of the war, the Battle of Queenstown is remembered for one heroically tragic loss. After the Americans had gained oh no. control of a cannon overlooking the escarpment, Brock personally led a daring charge to get it back. All right, chums, let's do this. Isaac Brock! Oh no! Brother, are you all right? What's wrong? I felt a great disturbance in the force, <laughs> as if one beautiful voice suddenly cried out in terror and was suddenly silenced. I fear something terrible has happened. Despite repelling the first real attempt at invading Canada, Britain had lost one of its best officers, and Tecumseh had lost his best ally. Do, do, do. The 1812 invasion of Canada turned out to be fail, a fail, fail. part, so you can imagine how bad the war at sea was going. And you would be wrong. The Americans finally scored a W when the USS Constitution whooped the derriere of the HMS Guerrier and earned itself the nickname Old Ironsides after British cannonballs bounced off of it. How was this possible? First mate, activate the secret weapon! <laughs> Star. <laughs> Still, the first year of the war had been generally terrible for the Americans, and President Madison looked forward to improvements in 1813. Secretary of War Armstrong, I have to say, I feel good. It's me! Look! That's me! My first line! 
All right, here we go. Get ready to cringe. Hold on, let's go back. First year of the war had been gen Still, the first year of the war had been generally terrible for the Americans, and President Madison looked forward to improvements in 1813. Secretary of War Armstrong, I have to say, I feel good. It's a so I'm Secretary of War, so yeah. New year, a new war, anything new to report? Yeah, we just got massacred at River Raisin. Oh, fuck. That wasn't very good. War? Anything new to report? Yeah, we just got massacred at River Raisin. Oh, fart. Out West, William Henry Harrison. Nah. It was very good. You know what can be hard when you're doing voices or whatever voice acting is? Like, you don't really have direction. It can be kind of hard. Like, you know, it's someone to bounce off of. It gives me respect for people that do real, like, actual voice acting because... You know, it's so it's much easier because a lot of times they just do their lines, you know, and, and, and having like a back and forth and like a director. I mean, you usually have a director there. Um, but well, let's listen one more time. It was just the one line for this for this part. I, I have more later. But he did say he was going to make him look like me. <laughs> I think it's pretty good. You think it's pretty good. Wait, this way. It's pretty good. You got my freckle. Or my mole thing. Hey, I feel good. It's a new year, a new war. Anything new to report? Yeah, we just got massacred at River Raisin. Oh, fart. Out west, William Henry Harrison, on a mission to retake Detroit, dug in at the newly built Fort hey, Mays. It, 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 my first time, okay? It's my first time. Tecumseh and Isaac Brock's replacement, Henry Proctor, laid siege to the fort. But to Tecumseh, the whole thing felt weird. So what do we do now? We wait. We just wait? We don't attack? Old chap, you have much to learn about modern warfare. Now, the entire run of BBC's Dribbleshins of Derbyshire just came out on Netflix, so you know where to find me. Two <laughs> weeks later. Well, that's done. Time to back it in, chaps. Wait, you're just leaving? Yes, well, they're not giving up, and I'm out of crisps. Let's go, gentlemen. <laughs> oh, Isaac. I could really use you now. <laughs> Back in the Atlantic, things weren't going well for the Americans. You had a massive blockade, and on June 1st, the USS Chesapeake had the cojones to engage the HMS Shannon. Mortally wounded and at death's door, the Chesapeake's captain, James Lawrence, told his crew, Don't give up the ship. And then his men immediately gave up the ship. <laughs> but this message was not lost on Captain Oliver Hazard Perry. Perry was tasked with taking Lake Erie, the key to successfully invading Canada. So he built a fleet on the lake and went up against the Brits in his flagship, the USS Lawrence. Don't give up the ship, boys! Oh no. Captain? Oh, oh I meant that ship, the Niagara! Don't give up that ship! Let's get out of here. Perry and his ships had defeated the British fleet, gained control of the lake, and opened the door to an invasion of Canada. This prompted British Ooh. General Proctor to abandon Detroit. Where are you going? Back to Canada. We have to protect our land. What about my land? I thought we were allies. I know, right? An Englishman abandoning his Indian allies could knock me over with a feather. <laughs> Brothers, we will run no more. We take a stand here together. Sing like your death screwed song over. and die like a hero going home. Isaac? Tecumseh, they finally get you? Yeah, your people abandoned us again. I had a feeling. Who's that guy? I don't know. Apparently it's reference humor and some people find it funny. With the Yoda. death of Tecumseh, individual tribes were forced to sign peace agreements. Mm -hmm. And the widespread destruction of Indian cultures at the hands of American expansionism mm -hmm. would truly begin. It's kind of like the final, well, just wait till Trail of Tears, but at least for this group up in the north this is this is the end for them by the fall of 1813 america was finally ready to give invading canada another shot again trying to invade lower canada with the primary objective of taking montreal this invasion failed yet again that's important my montreal's in the st lawrence river that's that's a huge strategic place to take for the st lawrence going into the ocean and then getting eventually to the great lakes that's we know why Montreal exists. Partially because a thousand New York militiamen refused to actually cross the border. Partially because the American officers in charge, Hampton and Wilkinson's, hated each other on a real housewives level. But mostly because of French-Canadian Lieutenant Colonel Charles de Salaberry. 
and his defensive force consisting completely of Canadians. Militiamen, Voltigeurs, Indians, the kids in the hall, all <laughs> Canadians. Now, invading Upper Canada had gone a lot better in 1813. In fact, American forces were able to take York, then capital of Upper Canada, which they burned to the ground. There's those weird shadows again. And by December, <laughs> they took Newark, the former capital of Upper Canada, and burned that to the ground, too. Again, with oh, these burning everything shadows. Down. And to top it all off, Madison received word on December 30th that the British were open to peace negotiations. Dolly, I have to say that the war is finally turning in our favor, provided circumstances don't change in a sudden and drastic way. And then circumstances changed in a sudden and drastic way. By April of 1814, Napoleon had abdicated the throne, freeing Britain to attend to... Don't worry, he'll be back. He'll be back. Other matters. All right. Okay, last part, part three. So yeah, this part had just one line. Um, I think all the rest of my lines are in, in well, I mean, they are there in uh, the last part in part three. So you saw a little bit if you were interested in that, but hopefully you're just, you're loving following along right now with all the Great War of 1812 stuff. I haven't commented a lot. Again, I just don't want to make this uh, like a huge video, but I'm learning a ton um, about a lot of the details. I don't teach US history anymore. So um, a lot of stuff is like a refresher for me great all right last one so this one's titled ending ending america's dumbest war <laughs> okay all right last part here we go previously on drawn of history hey dolly we just declared war on britain so the americans wouldn't have to face the full might of the british military yet did we just become best friends yep the 1812 invasion of Canada turned out to be a wet fart. Cue the Time notes. to give up the ship, boys. Tecumseh, they finally get you. American forces were able to take York, which they take burned Toronto, to the Toronto, take Montreal. Napoleon had abdicated the throne, freeing Britain to attend to other matters. We're all enjoying this. This has been awesome. All right, Thousands time. of troops, vessels, and equipment now free from the Peninsula War were sent from England. Defenses were strengthened along the Canadian border. Which is exactly where they're going to strike. Me! Okay. Thousands of troops, vessels, and equipment now free from the Peninsula War were sent from England. Defenses were strengthened along the Canadian border. Which is exactly where they're going to strike. That's where we should have our men. What about here, Secretary Armstrong? Well, I suppose we should leave some defenses in Baltimore. No, I mean here in Washington, D.C. Mr. President, I can't honestly think of one reason why they would attack our capital. <laughs> I, I could have emoted more. Again, it was just lack of direct, you know, it, 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 I'll, get, I'll get better, I promise. Defenses were strengthened along the Canadian border. Which is exactly where they're going to strike. That's where we should have our men. What about here, Secretary Armstrong? Well, I suppose we should leave some defenses in Baltimore. No, I mean here in Washington, D.C. Mr. President, I can't honestly think of one reason why they would attack our capital. <laughs> yeah, I think this foreshadow setup is about to pay off. And he was <laughs> right. By August, British Admiral Cockburn and Major it General... Is whatever. It was okay. Ross were traveling up the Chesapeake fun, towards though. the capital, Very destroying fun. everything in their wake and freeing thousands of slaves along the way. Where are you going, boy? You can't go joining the Brits. That's un American. Think of all this country has done for you. A hastily assembled militia force at Bladensburg. Um, if you didn't know, kind of the history of how how um, the British dealt with slaves in the colonies. You know, so going back to American Revolution, the um, British tried to get uh, African Americans, you know, and and, and slaves um, on board. And one of the things that they were saying was that if they helped fight, right, uh, with the British, that they would then um, and slavery, like in the United States. So, uh, slaves had every motivation to pretty much join the British, um, in these wars. And it looks like that relationship is trying to be renewed a little bit in the war of 1812. Tempted to stop the British ground troops. It was less than effective. And it became clear that the capital was about to be destroyed. Oh, no. Who could have seen this coming? 
Madison and other government officials had already fled Washington after the Battle of Bladensburg. I think I forgot something. Hey, if you forgot it, it probably wasn't all that important. Yeah, you're right. Paul, grab this painting. We've got to get out of here. Ma'am, the frame is bolted into the wall. So? Ma'am, it's not even the original. I think you could see the watermark. <laughs> Damn it, Paul. Just grab it. We've got to get out of here. Paul Jennings, go grab that painting. You know, I'll take all the credit for it. You could just lock it on your back the whole time. You know, grab <gasps> Me! Soon, the whole city was on the run, including government clerk Stephen Pleasanton, who had been tasked with saving important documents and along the way ran into Secretary okay, Armstrong. Yeah. What do you have there? The Articles of Confederation? The Constitution? Are you stealing the Declaration of Independence? Of course not. Who do I look like? Nicholas Cage. Alarmists. The whole lot of them. Nah, these Brits are just posturing. Washington will never be the real target. This is fine. It wasn't <laughs> fine. <laughs> It is, it's good writing. Let me go back to me again. I'll grab your own pain. Soon, the whole city was on the run, including government clerk Stephen Pleasanton, who had been tasked with saving important documents and along the way ran into Secretary Armstrong. What do you have there? The Articles of Confederation? The Constitution? Are you stealing the Declaration of Independence? Of course not. Who do I look like? Alarmists. The whole lot of them. Nah, these Brits are just posturing. Washington will never be the real target. This is fine. It wasn't fine. The British Army... That one was a little better, because it had more dialogue to kind of go off of. I can definitely emote more. You always... I, I, I feel like... Maybe this is how acting works, but... um, It's like you, you feel like you're... Showing more emotion than I think you actually are. I think that's what I'm taking away from some of this. It's like in my eyes, I was like emoting, like when I was recording it. In my ears, I guess I would say. But really when it comes off on the other side, it it doesn't come off nearly as much as you think it does. And that's good going forward. But that, that was that was first a lot of fun. I like Capitol that. Building. That scene was fun. Oh, what's that guy? Wasn't fine. The British Army first burned down the Capitol building. <laughs> good timing. And then set fire to the White House. But not before it was Make looted America, and General British Ross again. pocketed Madison's love letters to Dolly. Speaking of Ross, why would you do that? <laughs> well, that makes sense. Ironically, the capital might have already been doomed because just then, a freak hurricane hit D.C., spawning off a weather phenomenon unfamiliar to most Brits. What in the bloody hell is that? It's a tornado. What's a tornado? Finger of God. <laughs> yeah. Meanwhile, the economy had been in the tank all war long due to the British blockade. And throughout 1814, New England Federalists against the war in the first place kept meeting in the Hartford Convention. This war has been a mistake from the beginning, and these embargoes are killing us! <laughs> Mr. Madison's war is a travesty! We should have amendments requiring two-thirds majority to declare war, a one-term presidential limit, and a rule stating that consecutive presidents can't be from the same state! Yeah, and if not, New England should secede and start its own country. <laughs> we okay. could make Tom Brady dictator for life. <laughs> yeah, the secession part of the Hartford <laughs> Convention tends to be overstated. <laughs> <They're> like... <laughs> I mean, come on. What region would really be dumb enough to try to secede? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the Americans were not in a position of power as peace talks got underway in Ghent, Belgium. We want an Indian barrier state. No. Yes, we want an Indian barrier state from Ohio to Wisconsin. And we want Maine. Maine is off the table. The Treaty of Paris specifically says it's ours. Now, if this is the level of negotiation we can expect, I'd rather go swim naked in Scheldt River. Honestly, I've been looking forward to it. I've always found letting my little Quincy take a little Rincey is quite restorative. Uh, these okay, the, yeah. These other voice actors are so much better than me. I gotta take note. They're just in there working on the Treaty of Ghent. They said they'd call me in when they needed me. Ah, I'm here for the Berlin Conference. They said the same thing. But September of 1814, nah, we shake up more negotiations. Berlin conference. With an additional disaster for Africa. troops now in Canada, the British attempted to invade New York, but were turned back at Lake Champlain. Concurrently, the forces that had just raised Washington, D.C. were about to lay waste to Baltimore. See? I told you. U.S. Major Me! See? We're about to lay waste to Baltimore. See? I told you. 
U.S. Major General Sam Smith led militias to hold <laughs> off invading troops and had Baltimore ships sunk to cut off no access comment, to the really. harbor. <laughs> what? What the fuck? But if the British could bombard the overlooking Fort McHenry <laughs> into submission, the city would fall. And as the bombardment began, lawyer Francis Scott Key was aboard the nearby HMS Tonnet, attempting to secure a prisoner release. Anthem. So is this where we're going to discuss the release? Honestly, there's no need to lock the door. <coughs> oh. Dr. Beans, I'm here to negotiate your release. Yeah, you're doing one hell of a job. On September 13th, aboard the Tonnet, Key watched the attack on Fort McHenry through the day and long into the night. He peered into the darkness, illuminated only by rocket's red glare, and looked for the flag yep. that flew atop the fort. This is, of course, yeah, I mean, he's getting to it. The, the, the famous story of the where the lyrics for the national anthem came from for the United States. Was there, was there a national anthem before this of the United States? Someone let me know. And come morning, <coughs> the flag was still there. The British released Key and the prisoners and withdrew from Baltimore. Francis Scott Key, brimming with patriotism, quickly jotted down the verses that would become Defense of Fort McHenry. I gotta tell you, Francis, it's a great name, but it stinks. You should call it the Star Spangled Banner. Yeah. John, as a militia leader and my wife's brother-in-law, I respect your opinion, but... And why is it a poem? It should be a song. You should put it to music. Uh, I can't write music. Then just steal a song. Pick one that gets the crowd going. Oh, wait, I already did. Tell me what you think. Oh, say can you see by the dawn <laughs> early light was so proudly we held out the twilight to flee there. Yeah, that should be it. Yeah. All right, should be should not be switched to, to Smash Mouth. Uh, let's keep looking. Victories at Lake Champlain and Baltimore evened out the score a little, and both sides were uh, now looking to just be done with the war. So we'll pull back any forces we have left in Canada, but you'll need to get rid of the orders in council and stop impressing men. Orders in council were repealed before the war even started, and with no Napoleon, there's no need for impressment, so whatever. About that Indian buffer state. No dice. That stays ours. And Maine, too. Whatever. Are we done? I have concert tickets. Really? To what? The concert of Europe. Anyway, we're done here. Hmm. Status quo antebellum. What's that mean? It means as existed before the war. Nothing changes. It's like a tie, which feels weird. A tie in war is like a tie in baseball. It's like kissing don't, your... Don't tell it to the Canadians, all right? They are... Very much ones of saying victory. Sister. Hey, I could be into that. Ugh. And with that, the War of 1812 had finally drawn to a close. It's over. Only it didn't. See, Parliament needed to approve the treaty, which they did on December 30th, but Congress would only get it in February. Until then, it appeared that the war was still on. And remember those British forces that failed at Baltimore? Well, they headed down south to Louisiana and made their way to New Orleans, where one ornery son of a bitch named Andrew Jackson was waiting for them. Ever since being slashed with a sword by a redcoat as a boy, Jackson hated nothing more than the British. <laughs> well, maybe the Spanish, or the Indians, or the National Bank. Hate a lot okay, of he hated a lot of things, but in 1815, his hate was focused on the British. To prepare, he placed New Orleans under martial law and recruited everyone he could. And when the British arrived on January 8th, 1815, he gave the command. Americans! Assemble. <laughs> the Americans pummeled the British, which really didn't matter. The treaty was ratified as is when it, it reached Washington, matter. and now the war was It did. Done. It did give Alex... Uh, or <laughs> It did give Andrew Jackson, though, a lot of notoriety that definitely rode into his political career, eventually being the, the, the president of the United States. No winners, no losers. Unless, of course, you were the Indians. If nobody won the war, the indigenous people of the United States clearly lost. And they would spend the next 100 years watching so much of what they had be ripped away. Right. As for the British, they immediately had a Napoleon problem yet again, so they never really had time to reflect on the War of 1812. They will, they promise. They'll have it reviewed by top men. Top, top men. men. 
The Canadians <laughs> remember this war, and their successful defense continues to be a source of pride. But they're also proud of Nickelback, so whatever. And considering the lukewarm enthusiasm going into it, it should be no surprise that America eventually forgot what actually happened, and yeah. instead focused on individual elements like Jackson, sure. Harrison, and that song that's really just about true. flat. We, we remember st the, the things we remember most are about individual things, not the actual causes and effects of the war, but individual stories. Very true. Eventually, with the United States, Great Britain, and Canada, time would heal all wounds and the nations would find themselves on better terms. True. Hey, uh, is this seat taken? 13? Whoa, nobody calls me that anymore. I'm the United States of America now. Oh, of course. <laughs> well, you look great. Ah, uh, me? Ah, uh, I stretch from shore to shore, but you? Hey, we've all put on some provinces. Provinces? <laughs> Is that like metric for states or something? Oh, good old 13. Hey, Canada, I just wanted to say sorry for trying to invade you all those times when we were kids. Thanks. That means a lot. Hey, would you like to dance? As friends. I'd like that. 13? Yes, Canada. Get your hand off my ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's hot. Damn it, Ross, are you reading those Madison letters again? Shut up, Cockburn, it's been a long war. Why don't you that do something more productive, part. like subscribing to Troll of History, <laughs> or checking out another video, or being a Patreon patron like these heroes over here? That shouldn't have been as funny as it was. That. So, uh, can I borrow them when you're done? No. Oh man! All right, let's talk about it. <laughs> All right, we're back. So, like, like I told you at the very beginning of this video, um, Drawn of History might be the best channel you're not watching yet. Okay, but there's no excuse to, especially if you've made it through my video here, you know, this far. It's got to mean that you really liked it, and I hope that's the case. So, that was awesome. That was super informative. Like, if I was, honestly, if I was teaching U.S. history again, and I needed, you know, just to throw in some content for, to, to supplement lessons, I would, I would totally throw these in. Um, they would be great, uh, great for that. So, tell your teachers, tell your teachers if you're taking U.S. history, you know, about this channel, and maybe you can get it in your classroom, so... Anyways, uh, that was awesome. Um, I know a lot of you came here because I wanted to see my reaction to myself. I got a lot to learn, but it was a lot of fun. I'd love to keep doing uh, voice acting stuff. I, I, I definitely learned a lot just from doing just those few lines. Um, but it's a lot of fun. I would definitely really, really like to do more of it. So it was a little bit cringe, I guess, just sitting here in myself. And I hear myself a lot making videos, but you know, actually having lines um, is very different than even ad-libbing. I, I, I feel like I'm pretty good at ad-libbing. Um, for the most part, but you know, going over the same lines over and over, it's a completely different skill. And I think, again, I think the thing I took away most is you're never, you don't seem to be emoting as much as you think you are um, when you do lines, you know, of any kind of voice acting, probably just acting in general. And uh, but that was great. But just from the 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 um, talking about the videos themselves, very good. The, these videos are getting better and better. Kind of like you saw that with oversimplified, and I guess really, I mean, all the major, especially animated creators is they get better at going on uh, as they go on specifically with the writing the writing is always the best part and that's what's definitely happening here so i'm i'm very excited i mean john of history right now only has four thousand subs and that's criminally no uh, low i know it's a new channel but like that's got to change big time so please please go over there go to the links down below and um, go sub I, you're gonna like it even if you're not into u.s history um you're gonna learn a lot about it but they also uh, he also has some other stuff of some other topics outside of u.s history that are really good too so anyway a lot of fun um again drawn a history mr betts let me know if you want me to do more stuff i'd love to i'd love to help out that was a lot of fun and yeah, I'd love to do more of this. All right, with that, you guys, again, links down below, links to um, some other things as well, and we'll go ahead and leave you here. Okay, thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time. Bye.